Shabbat Shalom, everybody. I want to thank you for joining us today in this beautiful Shabbat. And um, just want to welcome you to this week's Torah portion, the Parashat Toldot. And the Parashat Toldot, the word Toldot means generations. And today we're going to ask ourselves, does Hashem or God choose favorites? So the portion for this week comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 25, verse 19 through chapter 28, verse 9. For the Haftarah, the prophetic portion, we read from 1 Samuel, chapter 20, verses 18 through 42, and Malachi, chapter 1, verses 1 through, verses 1 through chapter 2, verse 7. And then for the Brit Hadashah, or the New Testament, or New Covenant, we read from Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 through 22, Romans 9, chapter Chapter 9, verses 6 through 29, and Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 17. There's not a whole lot on this week's uh, New Covenant reading. So I hope you enjoy reading. And before we start, I would just like to open this time in prayer, as we always do. So Heavenly Father, we want to thank you very much for this time to be able to spend with you and in your word and <clears throat> to study your ways. I love how everything connects from the old to the new and that your word never, never passes, never changes, and that you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I ask that you will speak to us through your Ruach HaKodesh and that it will be guided by you. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Amen. So my name is Rabbi Harel Clint Fry here in Perugia, Italy. And again, I want to thank you for joining us today. And um, so we're going to open up with the first verse of the reading. And these are the generations, or toldot in Hebrew, of Yitzchak, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Yitzchak, Abraham and Isaac. This is Genesis 25, 19. So last week in the parasha Chaye Sarah, the life of Sarah, <coughs> where she died, Abraham sent his senior servant to find an appropriate bride for his 40-year-old son, Isaac, or Yitzchak. Abraham was acting in faith on Hashem's promise to give land to his offspring, which is mentioned in Genesis 24, verses 6 and 7, finding a wife from among Abraham's relatives to raise up offspring, rather than from among the Canaanites. This became a priority as Abraham's life drew to a close. Abraham's faith was not passive people. And I really liked that about him. He, he actively cooperated with Hashem's purposes and promises. If you think about it, he was given a promise and he took action to make sure he did his part so that this would happen. Okay, so if Hashem promises us something, obviously that takes action on our part to do something. It's not just going to happen by itself. So this week's parasha, like I said, is called Todot which means descendants or generations. And the word toldot is, comes from the Hebrew uh, verb yalad. And you're thinking, how does toldot come from yalad? But it means to bring forth or beget, as in producing offspring. So in this portion, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, becomes pregnant after being childless for 20 years. So when the babies in her womb are wrestling with each other, she seeks Adonai to find out what's going on right, for answers. So Adonai provides her with a prophetic insight, telling her that two nations are inside her womb <clears throat> and that the older will serve the younger. And this is found in Genesis 25, 23. So as we know, she gives birth to two twins, Jacob and Esau, Yaakov and Esau, and a sibling rivalry begins that still continues even to this day between the descendants of Jacob, which are the Jewish people and the descendants of Esau, which are generally Arab Muslims. Okay, so Esau's name is, comes from the Semitic uh, root word Seir, which means thick haired, since he was born hairy. Jacob's name means heel, Yaakov, since he came out of the womb holding on to his twin brother's heel. So this symbolizes that his tenacity and persistence in struggling for the blessing of the birthright that belonged to Esau, who was the firstborn. <clears throat> okay, whoever comes out first, that's the firstborn. 
So the name Yaakov or Jacob can also be seen to mean crooked or deceitful. So Esau makes reference to this meaning when he says, isn't he rightly named Jacob? This is the second time he has taken advantage of me. He took my birthright, and now he's taken my blessing. And we'll get into that. Genesis 27, 36. So remember, Jacob tricked the father into giving him Esau's blessing. Now, twins could not be more different. I mean, these two are completely opposites. Esau's a hunter, you know, type of guy. Jacob is a home, he's a homeboy. He likes to cook, help out the mom. I'm not. I have to say, I find myself in both of these characters. I like to hunt and I like to cook and, and help out in the house. So uh, <clears throat> it's kind of fun to see both parts in two different people. Esau, it seems, also has a rebellious, foolish side, as we know. So one day he came home, he comes home, he's famished, he's hungry from hunting, and he exchanged his birthright as firstborn for a bowl of Jacob's red stew which is most people say is probably lentils. So because of this, he was called Edom, a, main, a name which shares the same Hebrew word for red, which is Adom. Okay, Adam, remember the name of Adam means red and from the earth. And this comes from Genesis 2530. So let's talk about now blessings when we're hungry or during time of famine. It says Isaac planted crops in the land in that land, and the same year reaped a 100-fold because the Lord blessed him, Genesis 26, 12. So in this parasha, a famine in the land is similar to the one that inspired Abraham to journey to, journey to Egypt, causes Isaac <clears throat> to go to Abimelech of the Philistines in Gerar, a town in southern Canaan. There in Gerar, Hashem confirms the Abrahamic covenant with Isaac by promising in Genesis 26, verses 2 through 5, stay in this land for a while. I will be with you and I will bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands and I will confirm the oath I swore to your father, Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. <clears throat> So Isaac grows exceedingly wealthy in this place called uh, Gerar, so much that the Philistines become envious <clears throat> and they fill up the wells that Abraham had dug, all right? They fill them with earth, sand, whatever. So such an action was very devastating, as we know, in the dry desert land where water is precious and vital to life, all right? So... Isaac also becomes so powerful in Gerar that King Abimelech tells him to move away. He's like, get out of here. <laughs> After he eventually makes his way to Beersheba, Hashem once again reaffirms the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 26, verse 24. I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant, Abraham. So in keeping with this word of comfort and encouragement, Abimelech comes to Abraham while he's in Beersheba, okay, in English Beersheba, despite his hatred of Abraham. And in this is found in Genesis 26, 27, he makes a covenant, or in Hebrew, a Brit of peace with him. Okay, uh, <clears throat> it says, when the Lord takes pleasure in anyone's way, he causes their enemies to make peace with them. Proverbs 16, 7, I love that verse. And I, I have, I've lived that in my life. It's, it's truly amazing to see how Hashem can work <clears throat> even with some of your worst enemies when you belong to him. So I'd like to talk about what it means to securing the blessing now. So as Isaac comes near the end of his life, he seeks to give Esau or entrust Esau with the job of carrying on Abraham's tradition and to secure the succession for Esau. <clears throat> he tells Esau, and when he comes in with a special meal of wild game, he will pronounce over him the blessing of the firstborn. So Rebecca, or in, in Hebrew, it's Rivka, who has known from the time of her pregnancy that Esau would serve Jacob. This is what right, the, the <clears throat> angel of the Lord told her. She understands that the true nation of, nature of her sons overhears her husband's plan. And in the same way, perhaps, 
that Abraham took active measures to secure the promises of Hashem, she resolves to send in Jacob, disguised as Esau, to receive the blessing instead. So although Jacob is reluctant to deceive his father, he also does not want to refuse what his mother says, all right? She, he loves her. So when she takes responsibility for the act, she says, don't worry, whatever happens will come to me. He disguises himself as Esau and brings to Isaac the meal his mother has prepared to taste like wild game. <clears throat> so although though Isaac, who has difficulty seeing, is not entirely certain which of the twins is before him, right? He feels this fleece upon his son. I mean, I don't know how anybody could be that hairy, to tell you the truth, but <laughs> obviously he was really, maybe wasn't feeling too well with his hands. I don't know. So this trick works. He blesses Jacob. Esau holds a grudge against Jacob for good reason. And when Rebecca overhears Esau threatening to kill Jacob after his father's death, he and Isaac send Jacob to Rebekah's brother Laban to find a wife. So before Isaac sends Jacob on his journey, he passes the torch by pronouncing the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant over him. It says in Genesis 28, verses 3 and 4, May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and increase your numbers until you become a community of peoples. May he give you and your descendants a blessing given to Abraham, so that you may take possession of the land where you now reside as a foreigner, the land God gave to Abraham. So, basically, Jacob reaps what he sows, right? <clears throat> this is true for any of us in life. Whatever we sow, we're going to reap. The fact that Jacob took advantage of the vulnerability of his blind elderly father to receive his blessing is an act that the Torah neither condemns nor justifies. However, it seems that Jacob did not entirely escape the consequences of his deceit. So the, in the following chapters of Genesis, Jacob tastes the bitterness of deceit when Laban tricks him into marrying the younger of the two sisters, Leah, rather than Rachel, whom he really loves. As Rachel was the younger one. And in fact, in that time, it was <clears throat> common. I mean, it was what we call um, everyday use, okay, to always marry off the oldest of the daughters first and then go down the line. So this kind of proved the principle that we will sow what we reap. Jacob <laughs> gets tricked into marrying the two sisters First, the one he doesn't love. And then he says, okay, I'll work for another seven years if you'll let me marry Rachel. So Jacob also suffers for 20 long years under the exploitation of his father-in-law. <clears throat> he tries to cheat him out of his wages many times. So despite all this hardship, Jacob presses in for the blessing and eventually has great success. He goes through, he gets through that. <clears throat> his father, he fathers the 12 sons who had become the foundation of the 12 tribes of Israel. And it's amazing because 10 of these 12 tribes come from Leah. Only two come from Rachel. Pretty amazing. So what does it mean to prefer one, uh, preferring one another or preferring somebody over another person? It says in Romans 12, 10, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves. So those who might contend for a throne, leadership position, or job don't need to be caught up or embroiled in hostile rivalry as Jacob and Esau were. In the Haftarah, our prophetic portion uh, for Shabbat Machor Kodesh, King Saul's John, uh, son, John, son Jonathan, I can't speak, <laughs> would have been in line for the throne. However, David... He's obviously favored by Hashem because remember, God had said, Hashem said, hey, I'm done with you, Saul. I'm cutting you off. I'm going to destroy your family because of his disobedience when he did kill all the people that he was supposed to kill. And they made up excuses. Also, he, he took some of the animals and he was supposed to kill all of them. So <clears throat> David is favored by Hashem. He's extremely popular with the people. And it seems to be clear to both Saul and Jonathan, Jonathan that David will be king. However, Jonathan doesn't care. He's like, he, he loves David. But Saul, because of this, seeks to kill David a few times. 
And while Jonathan remains true to his father, he also remains true to David and protects him by sending him away as a friend and a brother. So instead of succumbing to envy and jealousy, as Esau did, he does not covet the throne and chooses to maintain, maintain his friendship with David instead. And I never did understand why it is Hashem, yes, he said he would destroy Saul and his family, but I didn't understand why he couldn't at least save Jonathan, because at least Jonathan was on the side of David. But when Hashem says something, he means it. <laughs> so Jonathan in 1 Samuel 20, 42, Jonathan said to David, go in peace for, for we have for, sworn friendship with each other in the name of Adonai, saying, Adonai is witness between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. So I'd like to talk about Hashem's love for the children of Jacob. <clears throat> It says, yet I loved Jacob, but Esau I hated. In Hebrew, it's Sone. Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. So in the regular Haftarah Toldot, which is Malachi verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through chapter 2, 7, Hashem affirms his love for the children of Jacob and confirms the reckoning that the children of Esau, who have mistreated their cousins, will face. He declares through the prophet Malachi, I have loved Jacob, but Esau I hated, and I have turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Malachi 1, 2 through 3. So the Hebrew word that is translated like I said hated here is sone, <clears throat> which is often used in a comparative sense. Though it does not mean hate literally, the, the English word does not carry the full meaning. So sone has more of a sense of to love less or to reject. Okay, it is similar to the preference that Jacob had for his wife, Rachel, over his wife, Leah. Okay, hey, I prefer you over such and such. So also this Hebrew word, Sone, is likely behind Yeshua's statement, Jesus' statement in Luke, where it says in Luke 14, 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate the father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Here he's not really meaning hate. But what are you saying? Hey, if you prefer your life and your mom and dad and your wife and children, et cetera, et cetera, over me, you can't be my disciple. So it doesn't really mean hate. Okay, it's a horrible, horrible translation. And I wish people had learned, could learn that when they were translating back when they did, to translate it correctly. And it's not that difficult to understand. Hey, it doesn't mean hate. It means prefer. Or you, you'd rather do this than that. It's not that difficult, but this is what it really means. And I've always thought, why would Hashem tell us to hate somebody? Basically saying, hey, are you willing to leave this stuff behind, even your family, to come serve me? Because that's what the disciples did. The majority of them were married, yet they left their wife and kids and everybody and left to do Hashem's work. So the idea here is that we must love our family members and all these other things, our life even, less than Adonai, less than Hashem. This does not diminish the love that we must show them, okay? It, but it elevates and prioritizes the love that we must have for Hashem, for Adonai. And perhaps this is also explains Jonathan's behavior. He remained loyal to his father, right, but did not he didn't cooperate with his murderous plans against David. And of course, we can offer no such explanation for why Hashem chose David over Jonathan. Although, like he said, he, he had cut off Saul, said, I do not want you anymore. I'm rejecting you as king, and your family will be obliterated. So who would have been the expect? He would have been the expected heir of the throne after Saul's death. So although Hashem gives no explanation of his preference for Jacob, we might assume it is because Esau grew to be very carnal. He was a carnal. He's like, I don't care about my blessing. I don't care about whatever. Here, I want a bowl of soup. So he was a man given to hunting and killing. I mean, hunting isn't wrong. Okay, if you're doing it for food and you're needing it to eat, that's one thing. Whereas Jacob embraced spirituality as his highest purpose in life. Who knows? So although we might take offense toward Hashem over his choosing one person over another and asking why should he prefer Jacob over Esau, what, doesn't Hashem love all his children equally? 
we need to understand that Hashem in his mercy is carrying out a plan for our welfare. Okay. So if he eliminates some people out of your life, thank him. Because he's got something amazing for you. He has taken people out of my life that I am very so glad they're not in my life anymore. And he's replaced them with people who need to be in my life. Okay, so I'm happy that these people are no longer in my life and that I have those in my life who need to be in my life. And I'm not that I'm the kind of person I don't think twice if Hashem tells me to do something, if he tells me to leave my mom and dad, which I've done, to come to Italy or whoever, I don't think about it. I love them dearly. They are my parents. They are my relatives, whoever, but I will not put them over him. If he tells me to do something, I'm going to do it. So he has ordained some people, even before birth, from before birth or before the womb, for special purposes and destinies. Okay. So if you don't know your purpose and destiny, maybe ask him. If you're still alive after so many trials and tribulations in your life, leaving loved ones, whatever, and even maybe people in your lives, maybe even wives or husbands or whatever, I don't know. Ask him, hey, I'm still here after all this stuff. What do you have for me? What do you want for me? What is your plan for me? He'll tell you he, through somebody or he'll tell you directly or through reading something. He will let you know. Okay, he, he wants to use us. He doesn't have to, but he chooses people for specific things. All right, so the prophet Jeremiah was one of these. It says in Jeremiah 1.5, the Lord said to him, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And I ordained you as a prophet to the nations. Okay, that's just one of the prophets. I mean, obviously he set aside many prophets, right? There were many prophets in the past. <laughs> So the Brit Hadashah, or New Testament portion, also addresses this issue, making it plain that the children of promise are Abraham's children. Who can fathom the ways of Hashem, people? He has called out from among both Jew and Gentile, those prepared before time, beforehand, for glory to the be vessels of mercy. That's incredible. So in closing, I'd like to go back to Isaac and how he prays for Rebekah. This is wonderful. So just as Abraham's wife, Sarah, was barren, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, was also unable to bear children. If I remember correctly, I don't even think she had a womb. I don't know. There was somebody who didn't have a womb in the Bible. And right now, to tell you the truth, I can't remember who it was. <laughs> but for 20 years, she and Isaac tried to have a child. And it's normal for a couple to desire children. But for Isaac, it was very critical. He was the inheritor of the great promises given to his father, Abraham. If he did not have children, those promises could not be passed on to the next generation. Isaac turned to Adonai and entreated him on behalf of Rebekah. And Isaac prayed to Adonai on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And Adonai answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Genesis 25, 21. So the Talmud, this is kind of funny, says, Why were our ancestors barren? Because the Holy One, blessed be he, longs to hear the prayer of the righteous. Maybe that's all he wants. He just wants us to come to him and say, hey, please, will you give us this? Or will you give me this? The thing you promised. He just wants us to hear it. That's why Yeshua, if you think about it, said, hey, you haven't received because you haven't asked. Anybody who asks for anything in my name, it will be given for the glory of my father. So he wants us to ask. Now there's a rabbi, Rashi, who's many years ago, makes Two notes on the Hebrew wording of Genesis 25, 21. When it says that Isaac prayed, he uses a word that implies entreaty. So entreating. Rashi explains that this means Isaac persistently prayed on her behalf. He didn't say one prayer. He says he kept on praying. And there's a, a verse also in the New Testament, in the Brit Hadashah, where it talks about that too. And he talks about the old lady the, who kept going before the king and he wouldn't do anything for her, but he finally just got tired of her and said, hey, do this for the, for the woman so she'll leave me alone. I'm very happy that Hashem is not like that. But basically saying, hey, be persistent in your prayers. So we can assume that Isaac had been praying throughout the 20 years of her barrenness. It doesn't say this, but we could assume this is what happened. So that is persistent prayer. 
Like I said, Yeshua teaches us to pray insistently. He said persistent prayer can be compared to a widow, like I said, who continually entreated the local king to hear her case. Although the, the king neither feared Hashem nor respected men, <clears throat> not a very nice guy, he decided to hear her case, lest she wear him out with her nagging. If persistent entreaty works on an unjust king who neither fears Hashem nor men, how much more so will the just judge himself, the just king of the universe, be moved to answer our entreaties, our prayers. Okay? <clears throat> so Yeshua told another parable about the power of persistent prayer. He compared it to a man who needed to borrow food from his neighbor to feed an unexpected guest. But his neighbor had already gone to bed. It was late at night. Personally, if somebody shows at my house really late, I don't know if I'm going to answer or not. But I'm hoping I would because that's what Hashem told us to do. And Yeshua said that they do the same. So the man continued to ask his neighbor and treat his neighbor until the man eventually got out of bed, kept knocking. I guess if somebody keeps knocking at my door, ringing my bell, I'm going to answer. So he gave him what he needed. So a persistent entreaty works on a lazy, reluctant neighbor, how much more so on Hashem, who neither slumbers nor sleeps. And this is found in Luke 11, verses 5 through 8. Yeshua encourages us to pray persistently, everybody, saying, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Luke 11, 9. Now Rashi makes a second observation in the Hebrew wording of this passage. He notes that the Hebrew says that Isaac, Isaac entreated Adonai opposite his wife. And you're thinking, what does that mean? So he explains, Isaac stood in one corner and prayed, while Rebecca stood in the opposite corner and prayed. Or maybe opposite sides of the room, or opposite sides, opposite sides of the bed. <laughs> so in other words, Isaac and Rebecca prayed together. So Adonai heard the prayers of Isaac and Rebecca and answered by allowing Rebecca to conceive. Just as Sarah's conception of Isaac was a direct miraculous intervention of Hashem. So was it too with Rebecca. There is great power in the prayers or entreaties of a husband and wife who commit to praying together. Okay, let's remember that. He always hears our prayers, even when we're not with our other half. But when we are praying together, and there is written in the Bible, where two or more pray together in unity, and in agreement, so shall it be done. Okay, I can attest to this. This has happened in my life, and it's still happening even now. <clears throat> so, for those of you who need prayer, please contact us. We have a contact link below if you want to put it in the comments. But if you prefer, obviously, con contact link is, is more private and probably better. If you need counseling for anything, also, we have Machase Shatikfa link below, which uh, my wife, uh, Rebetzin Gavriela, does offer. And it's wonderful. It's Bible-based. And she can help you with that. She is a licensed counselor. If you'd like to support us in any way, we could use your support right now. Um, if we are a blessing to you in any way, please help us out. We, we do uh, all this that we do for the love of Hashem and for the love of you. We do not ask anything at all. So it's just something if you feel led to give, there is a link at the very bottom in the uh, comment in the uh, description below. If you'd also like to dedicate a Torah portion, we're going to start doing something new. Many synagogues will say, hey, if you want to dedicate a Torah portion to someone or a special occasion, you can also dedicate a Torah portion to somebody. So if you want to, you can also go into the support link. It's the same thing. And just specify or send us an email through the counseling. Say, hey, I... I've uh, done a support on your on your link. I've supported, and now I'd like to dedicate this. It's for a dedication of the Torah portion, such and such, whatever one's coming up in the, in the next uh, weeks or months, and we can do that also. And we will mention that dedication uh, here on YouTube and SoundCloud. So, for those of you who do not believe in Yeshua, Jesus as the Messiah, Moshiach. 
Now is the time to do so. If you want, we'll, we can get you a book sent to you. If you give us your details, um, name, address, uh, whatever you want, um, also your email, we can make sure you get a copy of a free book that's so wonderful to read and it, and it doesn't cost you a thing. So I'll make sure you get that book. And <clears throat> so just contact us and we can get that for you. If you'd like to accept Yeshua today as your Moshiach, as your savior, please say this prayer with me. And if you are, like I said, if you're wondering how is it possible that he is Messiah? When I've been told so many years of my life, he cannot be. Just read Isaiah 53, and it'll tell you everything. Okay, so please join me in this prayer. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu eterech ha-Yeshua b'Meshiach, Yeshua. Blessed are you, o Lord of God, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah, Yeshua. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope that you'll be blessed through these sermons. And if you are, please leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. And I would just like to bless you now with the ironic blessing. Yevarechecha Adonai Bishmarecha. Yair Adonai Panabalecha Bikunecha. Yisa Adonai Panabalecha Biesim Lecha Shalom. Beshem Yeshua HaMashiach. Sarha Shalom Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, Shalom. Thank you all and Shabbat Shalom.